I hope you enjoyed the previous video. I am a big believer in qualitative data visualization and inspection. And I think that picking neurons or data channels to look at randomly is a good way to start looking through a data set. However, of course, we also need to move towards more quantitative and representative data visualizations, and that's what we are going to do in this video and the next video. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this module, these data were recorded from this Utah array, which means that the neurons are all located somewhere on this 10 by 10 grid. So what we are going to do in this video is produce a spatial map of the average spike counts, and then we will visualize that overall activity level as an image. So it's gonna look something like this. So what you're looking at here is a visualization of the 10 by 10 matrix, where each block in this matrix corresponds to the physical location of an electrode in this recording array. And the color here corresponds to the average number of action potentials across all the neurons in each electrode. Now it's possible, in fact it happens, that there is more than one neuron recorded at each electrode, in which case we will um, average over all the neurons within each electrode. Okay, so the interpretation of this map is that the neurons around here up in this corner are relatively more active, and the neurons down here, well, these neurons are either inactive or there just weren't any neurons that were actually recorded at these electrodes. Now that's a possibility that we will disambiguate in the next video. Nonetheless, you can see that this is a really informative way of understanding the characteristics of the overall data set. Okay, so now I'm gonna to switch to MATLAB. Of course, if you would like to pause the video and work through the code on your own first, now is your opportunity. So this code here is a little bit more advanced than the code we've been working with so far in this module. So let me, before we get to the code per se, I wanna walk you through a little bit of the kinds of data that we are going to need to work with. We've so far been working with data.events, which contains all the data. And now to map this back onto space, we need data.channels and data.map. So data.channels, tells us this provides a mapping of each of these units here, each of these 106 neurons, and which channel in the data set, in the, in the grid, that, um, that neuron was recorded from. So we can type data.channels, and here you see we are interested in the first column here. So this column is telling us that the last neuron in the data set, so this is neuron 106, it was recorded from channel number 96. And here we see three times 95 here. So this means that these three neurons in the data set, so neuron 105, 104, and 103, all three of those neurons were recorded from the same physical channel. And that physical channel is called channel number 95. Now, the next question is, where are those channels actually located in space? And to access that information, we need to look at data.map. So you can see that data.map is a 10 by 10 matrix of integers. And now these numbers are telling us the, uh, the mapping of channel number to physical location. So here we see, for example, 96. So it gets a little confusing here, but th what we've learned so far is that the last neuron in the data set, so this is neuron data index number 106 was recorded from channel number 96, and channel number 96 is located in the first column and the sixth row of this channel array. So what we need to do in the code here is kind of like a double mapping. We need to find all of the uh, neurons that were recorded from channel number 96, in this case, and channel number 95, and all of these individual physical channels, find out what is the average number of action potentials, so the average spike rate across all the trials and all the stimulus orientations for each of these physical channels, for averaging across the neurons within those physical channels. And then we need to map that onto a 10 by 10 matrix using this indexing number. Okay, I hope that all makes sense. So let's get started. So the first thing we wanna do is compute the total number or the average, actually this should say the average, not the total number. So this is the average 
number of, of action potentials per cell. So remember, we're working with this data set. This is called total spike count. And this is three dimensional. So we want to get the average over all the trials. So we can average over the third dimension. However, this is not yet what we want. We want the number of action potentials or the average action, uh, average number of action potentials also averaging over the stimulus orientation. So in fact, we need to add another level of averaging here. So we're averaging over trials and over stimulus orientations. Okay, and then here I'm getting the uh, a list of all of the channels that contained units. So this is just all of the unique elements of data.channels and we want all rows and the first column. So this is telling us that there are 56 channels in total that had at least one neuron recorded on that physical data channel. So on that electrode. And the reason why this is 56 and data.channels is 106 is that there's many neurons that were recorded on the same data channel. So the same physical electrode. Okay, so now we're going to initialize and then create this map that we are going to create an image of. So spikes map, and this needs to be the same size as data, so the size of data.map. Okay, so this gives us our matrix of zeros, and in the end, we are going to visualize this. We're going to make an image of this variable, spikes map, after populating it with the average number of action potentials. Okay, so then we're looping over all of the data channels. And the reason why we're looping over the physical uh, electrodes instead of the, the neurons is that we want to get the average of all of the neurons from within each physical electrode. Okay, so now we are going to find all of the units that are on this physical electrode. So I called this variable which chance, but I guess it, it would probably be more accurate to call this which units. Maybe I'll change that. So we want to know which units or which neurons were recorded from this particular electrode. So that is data channels and the first column equals the unique chans and then chan i. So this is the chan ith element into unique chans. Now this is going to give us a Boolean vector. So let's run this and have a look at this. I will just dump this out. We can have a look. Now this looks like it's a bunch of zeros and somewhere there should be a one. But this is a logical array. So in fact, these are Booleans. This is true and these are all falses. So what this vector is telling us is that the first physical channel, which is channel number seven, had exactly one neuron recorded from it. And that neuron is the first neuron in out of 106. So this is the first neuron in our data set was recorded from channel number seven or electrode number seven. Now again, we need to map that onto the physical location. So here is channel seven. So now we need to find out which row and column contains channel number seven. And that's what we do here with find. So we get find and the output is going to be the row and column index. So now we know that electrode number seven is in the sixth row and the eighth column. So then we can use that as, uh, as indexing into this matrix spikes map. And then what we want here is the action potentials per cell from which chance like this. Now this could be in this particular case with the first data channel, it happens to be that this is only one number because there was only one unit recorded from this physical channel. But of course we want to average over all of these in the case that there are multiple neurons from the same electrode. All right, so that's quite a bit of code. You can see that this code is a bit more challenging than the code we've been working with in the past couple of videos. But of course, you are here to really learn MATLAB and you know not just to learn how to write a, a simple for loop. Okay, so now we have our matrix and I see now it looks completely wrong. So this is you know a, a good um, illustration of the importance of inspecting your variables. And I see actually the problem is that I defined that this variable, which chance, and then I decided to change the name of it to which units. So it's a really easy mistake to make. You have to be careful of that. Okay, so let's run this code again and make sure. 
Okay, now this is looking much more realistic. So this was not intentional, but a good illustration of the importance of carefully inspecting your data and, and your results and making sure that they look plausible. Okay, so now we're ready to see what this image looks like. So I'm gonna use the function image SC, the SC is for color scaling, and we can see what this spike map looks like. Very nice, now it's a little bit tall, so I am going to set the axis to be square. I'm going to add a color bar, and I'm also going to change the color map to be the MATLAB default, which is currently set to Parla. All right, so now just a few more things I wanna do at the end of this video, and that is to just you know make the, the, the plot look a little bit nicer. So what I wanna do is turn off the X and Y axis tick marks. So that's these, two, four, six, eight. I'm going to set the X tick property of the current axis to be empty. We can already run that and see what that does. So that turns off the X ticks. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the Y ticks like this. And I'm also gonna change the color limit. So MATLAB decided that a good color limit would be zero to 35. I am going to specify that the color limit should go from zero to how about 20. So let's watch what happens. So I'm gonna run this line of code. I want you to look at this map and at the color bar here and watch what happens when I run this line. Okay, so you see it got a little bit brighter over here. We saturated the high values a little bit. And now 20 is the top value. Now with this color map, Parla, people often associate yellow with positive numbers, dark blue with negative numbers, and green with zero values. However, we have dark blue at zero here. So I'm going to change this to a unicolor, a unipolar color map. And in this case, I'm gonna use color map hot. So now we get black values corresponding to zero and uh, going up through red and yellow, and then white colors corresponds to the maximum firing rate here. So this is also gonna be a transition into the next video where we will discuss issues of coloring circular data.